thank you so much for inviting me here. It really is an honor to be able to share my message with you today. So I want to thank the Acquired Brain Injury Island and EBIS for ha putting on this conference because there's nothing in my life that's more important uh, than concussion education policy and the research that we're doing. And I feel like I've walked into, you know, a bit of a hornet's nest here. Um, you know, this has been a big issue in the States for a long time, and it's really starting to spread worldwide. And I found myself an hour ago on a uh, radio program defending a comment that it was, I felt was kind of innocent. I, I made the comment that maybe we should raise the age that we start exposing children to brain trauma, or like, like say, raise the age we start hitting our kids in the head. And uh, I found myself, you know, uh, with fathers calling into the radio show saying, you know, why don't we wrap our kids in bubble wrap? And I feel like, uh, you know, the discussion today is really about finding that middle ground. Uh, the, nothing about what I'm going to talk about is anti-sport. You know, sports were a huge part of my life growing up. They still are. Uh, but what I've found is that there aren't a lot of benefits to brain trauma. And where we can avoid them, we should. And so there's no, there are very few things in health right now and in sports that are more serious and more complex than this, this issue. So I hope we can identify... So uh, there are also very few things that are so simply fixed. And so we're trying to walk through a little bit about the obvious simple things that we could do to dramatically reduce an athlete's risk of having negative consequences that come with brain trauma. So make sure I do this correctly. All right, so yeah, so we're going to provide a little bit of the history and the context for this new awareness that we have about brain trauma. And, and to understand where I'm coming from, you have to understand my past. And that's not, you know, I'm working on a PhD very slowly in behavioral neuroscience, but I'm not a doctor. All right, I came into this world because I got hit in the head. I was an, an all-Ivy, all-conference defensive lineman at Harvard University. And then, like most Harvard graduates, I decided to join WWE. Um, okay, I was the only one who did it. Um, there was, I should have probably learned my lesson when I was the first, but I did, we, we cover part of me up now because uh, I'm a professional. But I did have success there and I had a good time and I got to play a very fun character when I was on television. Uh, we have our sound with that? Uh, I, there we go, I'll start that over. You know, a friend of mine just made me realize that for the first time in history, Iowa State is being graced by an actual Harvard graduate. That's true. First time in history. Well, it's quite a little institution of higher learning you guys have going for you here. In fact, I'd say it's only about one yard short of being a legitimate university. They just lost a big football game. Uh, anyway, um, where are we? some technical difficulties here. But I, uh, I had a great time doing it until I got hit in the head a little bit too much. Uh, so this was just a, an average night. Uh, it's all right. It's that conversion from U.S. to uh, uh, <laughs> the European version. So I got a everything was great for me until June 2003, when uh, I got kicked in the head by the handsome man on the right, Bubba Ray Dudley, at a match at the Hartford Civic Center, where I got hit in the head so hard that when I hit the ground, I immediately realized I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was happening. And most importantly, I forgot who was supposed to win the match, because wrestling is fake, if you weren't sure. Um, and 10 years ago, though, we didn't know anything about concussions. So we didn't call time out and say, well, we should stop the match, get off the field, get assessed. It was, well, if I'm, I'm sitting there telling them, guys, I don't know what's going on. So they said, okay, well, let's just make up a new match that makes sense. And they found, we went for another five minutes, and they found a reason to pin me after beating me up for a while. We went backstage, and our athletic trainer stopped me, and he said, hey, it looked like you got hit in the head. Are you okay? And I'm standing there with a headache throbbing like I never had in my life. I'm nauseous. I'm still confused as to what's going on. But I knew, if I, the one thing I knew is that if I'm asked by my athletic trainer if I'm okay, my answer is, I'm fine. So I lied. Then I said, I'm fine, don't worry about it, leave me alone. And unfortunately, he listened to me. I went backstage, I crawled into a corner uh, you know, for an hour just trying to put the pieces back together. They stopped me on the way out. Are you sure you're good? Yeah, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. I was not fine. But I ended up driving three hours alone to the next town for the next show. And, Going to the next show the next night, still not feeling right, and they, you okay? I'm good. And I lied, and I lied, and I lied for five straight weeks where I either wrestled every night or I worked out. 
and I kept getting worse. And finally, they, they figured it out. And they said, we're going to stop you wrestling. And it just so happened that that night when I went to sleep, uh, I woke up on the floor of my hotel room, uh, surrounded by broken glass, uh, crushed nightstand, and with my girlfriend uh, screaming, uh, standing on the bed. I had no idea what had happened. She shared with me that she woke up to me trying to climb the wall. I'd never been a sleepwalker. Trying to climb the wall in a dream, sweating profusely. She couldn't wake me up. She, couldn't, she tried to pull me down, get me seated. She couldn't do it. And after a few minutes, something in the dream was falling. And, I, and I'm an athlete, so I went to jump and catch it. And she said I went headfirst into the wall and through the nightstand. And didn't wake up for another minute. And that's what it took to scare me straight. That's what it took for me to say, okay, well, maybe I should check out what I've done to my brain. And by that time, it was too late. Uh, the, the, all those hits to the head I took after the injury made it so the symptoms didn't go away for, for five years. I had headaches for five years, memory problems, depression, uh, and the sleepwalking, I had to be sedated. I took a pill every night to be sedated. So when I would have these nightmares, I would just talk to the closet. I wouldn't get out of bed. I was too, I, I couldn't you know, walk around. So um, it was a rough time for me. But for that first year, I was convinced I was going to get better tomorrow and I was going to go back. And so I traveled the country trying to find a doctor who would fix my brain and, and clear me. The first seven couldn't help me. Because the first seven asked me, well, you know, how many concussions have you had before this one? And my answer was always zero. 19 years of contact sports, I had never been diagnosed with a concussion. So they would say, well, if this is your first, we don't understand what's wrong with you. So you know, just call us when you feel better and we'll clear you. Doctor number eight was Robert Cantu, one of the world's experts on this. And he changed the question on me. And he said, well, I, I know you don't think you've had concussions, but how many times have you been hit in the head and you saw stars, you got dizzy, you felt confused, you were nauseous? And I started laughing. And I said, well, that happens all the time. What's the big deal? Those are dings, those are bell ringers. And he said, well, actually, those are concussions by another name. And can, can you remember how many you've had? And instantly, it was very easy for me to just come back and think about at least uh, four concussions I'd gotten in the previous couple of years wrestling, uh, at least a couple in football, but I only remember high school. I don't remember when I was a kid. And I, they're so vivid that I, I know the six guys who concussed me. Uh, this is my enemies list. I still, see the, I still see all of them on a regular basis, strangely. I'm going to get them back. Um, but it, it, it was just this, it just blew my mind that here I was, you know, a, a 24-year-old college graduate. I didn't know what a concussion was. And it turned out I wasn't alone. This was my first aha moment that maybe we didn't have our, our heads wrapped around this issue quite right. Because it wasn't just me who was hiding concussions. You actually look at the data and you, and you look at reported concussions. In 2003, uh, people talked about, well, the risk of, in American football, in rugby, in soccer, in uh, you know, all the contact sports is probably only about 2 to 6% of athletes getting concussions each year. Therefore, it's a minority of people. It's not a big deal. We'll manage them when they happen. Uh, but that only looked at medical records. And so the athletes kind of knew, well, we don't, if we don't tell you, it doesn't ever get into the medical record. So some smart doctors figured that out. And although this was never talked about in the press, it was in the medical literature where they actually said, forget going to the medical records, let's ask the athletes themselves. And they learned over a couple iterations of doing these surveys, well, we have to do it after the season so they'll be honest. We have to take their name off it and make it anonymous. Then they learned they had to take out the word concussion. Because if you ask people how many concussions you had, it was zero. If they did what Dr. Cantu did and just listed the symptoms and said, did you have these after you got hit in the head, they started being honest. And the number was not 2 to 6%. In American football, it was 50 to 70 percent. Each season, we're saying they were suffering these symptoms, and many of them multiple times. And this is what was one of those moments where I was like, does, does the medical establishment really not appreciate how much we're lying to them and how many times we're having symptomatic blows to the head? But I see Roy Lamont smiling at me, a pro rugby player. We, we've been lying about these things for a long time because we didn't know any better. All right, so the number of concussions that are happening is astronomical. This, the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. in 2007 or 8 updated their number from we think there's 300,000 a year to, whoops, we think there's somewhere between 1.6 and 3.8 million concussions in the U.S. in sports every year. And the number's probably much higher than that. So uh, the idea is we haven't been telling people about concussions, but also we have, it's because we haven't known. What the, the discussion in the narrative right now is very much about, well, we can't get the athletes to report because they don't want to come out of the game. 
And the reality is that is not the reason that they will cite for not talking about their concussions. It's been published before, and then we, we actually just published a study this year surveying college-age ice hockey players in the United States, asking them, it turned out they had not reported three out of four symptomatic events during 2011, 2012 season, even recently. The number one answer was they did not want to leave the game. The number one answer was they did not think it was a serious, serious enough injury to report, meaning it was an educational problem. Number two reason was they did not know it was a concussion. So sure, there are people that may not tell you, but right now it's not because of informed consent. They just don't know any better. And the sad thing about a number like that is this is in the era of awareness in the U.S., and these are 20-year-olds. This is not 10-year-olds. These are 20-year-olds who do not know they're getting injured. So it really sheds a light on how big the problem still is today, and we do not have it under control. And the problem really is it's because it's an invisible injury. Right? This is an injury that you can see. I'm not sure which one of those feet are backwards, but one of them is not going the right way. All right? And if this happened, you would probably stop the game, and you would probably help that person off the field, and you wouldn't ask them, Are you, can you go? Can you, can you think you can make it through this and play a little longer? We need you on the field. We're out of substitutions. Can you fight through this? All right? But that's just a leg, all right? and we can fix that. All right? That person will be back on the field and fine in a year. All right? But with brain injuries, we, we've been kind of skating along on the fact that it's hidden inside of our skull, and people don't bleed, and they don't complain because they don't have pain nerves in their brain, and so they can't feel the pain of the injury. And so we just said, okay, well then, if you'll keep going, we'll let you. And that's what's got to change. And so uh, I, I, my first foray into this, into this advocacy world was through a book called Head Games Football's Concussion Crisis that came out in 2006 that really I, I wrote because I, I just couldn't believe, A, I didn't know the definition of concussion, and no athletes did. B, no one had ever told me this idea of resting concussions. I would have happily taken a week or two off to let my brain recover after all of those events if I knew the consequences of the actions. But I didn't have that choice because no one had taught me. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and the sad thing is, it's not because uh, we didn't know any better. It's because we just refused to talk about it. This quote could have been written yesterday. During the past seven years, the practice has been too prevalent of allowing players to continue playing after concussion. Again, this year is true. Sports demanding personal contact should be avoided after concussion. Right? We could put that on the front page of this program today, but it was said in 1937 at the annual Football Coaches Association meeting. And you can find evidence after evidence of old reports that they knew this was bad for us, but we just refused to make this policy until the last few years. And so all of us who played sports were really let down you know, in, in, when we played because we knew better, but they asked us to keep playing. And then uh, point three was, was long-term effects. And this is what's kept me in the game. I was hoping that I could just write this book. It was my penance for doing something as dumb as being a pro wrestler, and I could move on with my life. But uh, the long-term effects are something that we're only really starting to appreciate, and they're very significant. And so uh, I felt this was worth further investigation. And so that, that book was actually turned into a documentary. Thank you for helping us throw, show a sneak preview last night. Uh, thanks for those who came. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it will, the, the official uh, global version focusing on sports like rugby and soccer will be out very soon to help spread the message. Uh, but it was this disease that we hadn't talked about in a while that became a bit of an obsession for me. Call, uh, it was named in 1928 as punch drunk disease by a medical examiner named Harrison Martland um, in New Jersey who noticed in treating some boxers and from hearing stories that they, people kept saying they had this similar problem after their careers of having problems with cognition, memory, slurred speech, walking, um, behavioral problems, addiction issues. There was just this, this strange syndrome that was prevalent among boxers, and that's why it was first named punch drunk. Um, it's technically now known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And the idea is it's, it's a degenerative brain disease that appears to be caused by trauma 
and, for so, and will start a degenerative process in your brain that would, will continue after you stop getting hit in the head. And I first learned about it not from Harrison Martland, because we stopped talking about punch drunk for some reason in the US. It's not very much discussed. It was because of Mike Webster. Mike Webster was the best player to ever play his position in the NFL uh, as a center. And after he retired at about 40 years old, never held another job, was known to be demented, homeless, uh, really rough stories if you dig into it. He died at 50 of heart disease. And the medical examiner there said he had just finished his, his, uh, his boards and had just had to review Punch Drunk. Uh, and he wasn't from the US, and so he said, you know, why wouldn't a football player get this just like a boxer would? And he decided to study his brain to see if he had, and run some special tests to see if he had chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Lo and behold, he did. And he became the first football player ever studied and first one who ever had it. He wrote it up as a, uh, a report in neurosurgery uh, which, I, which I saw and uh, wrote into the, the first uh, edition of Head Games. But I, I, while I was interested in it, it was amazing no one else talked about it. It was not media. The NFL actually tried to say it wasn't the correct diagnosis and it should be retracted as, a, as an article. And, and so I thought, geez, if they're going to fight on this, maybe what we should do is show more cases, because Webster can't be the only case. And I was, he actually published a second one, Terry Long, so he was two for two on what people were calling a one in a million shot back then. So I got involved in uh, November 2006, Andre Waters, who was a guy I grew up watching as a safety in the NFL, 44 years old, shot himself in the head. And I remembered him specifically because his nickname was Dirty Waters, because he loved to lead with his helmet and just hit people as hard as he could. And so I thought, you know, I kind of put the suicide together because another one of the, the second case, Terry Long, had committed suicide at the same age. And I decided to Google his concussion history. And I found this quote saying he stopped counting his concussions at, at uh, 15. He, he wouldn't say anything. He said, I wouldn't say anything. I would just sniff smelling salts and go back out there. So I thought, geez, I wonder, he's probably at risk for CTE. So long story short, I, I, I learned over the next couple of days, the only, you know, the way to get, a, I, I first called the medical examiner. I said, hey, are you gonna study his brain for CTE? And he told me I was crazy to think that he might have that. Uh, and that uh, even hits to the head could be connected with things like depression or uh, dementia or impulse control problems. But he did let me know that the way you get this done is you have to get the family's permission. So. I had to think about it and say, well, he said, so if, if the family wants to do it, he goes, I'll, I'll give you the brain. I kept some of it. So my choice was, do I track down his mother, who happened to be 85 years old, and say, uh, hey, you don't know me, but would you mind uh, chipping Andre's brain off to be studied? So I chose to call her, and uh, not knowing what would happen, luckily, the family was actually very appreciative that I called because they had seen him fall apart in the last two years prior to his suicide. Personality change, memory problems. Uh, he started like, getting lost driving around town, a town he'd lived in for a very long time. Uh, they found him crying on his doorstep. Uh, you know, neighbors would find him, just, just strange things. So they wanted to know. His brain uh, ended up being studied. He did have the disease, but I wanted to make sure people talked about it. So I reached out to the media. And I was lucky to find a, a reporter named Alan Schwartz who wasn't a football writer. I tried to get football writers to write about this, but they wouldn't because they knew that if they started uh, talking badly about the NFL, that the NFL would just say, okay, well, you are no longer invited to the locker room to do interviews. That's kind of how they were known to operate. So he was a baseball writer who said, this is important. And he was able to uh, work, uh, convince the New York Times to make it a front page story. And that's what really started our era of awareness in the U.S. It was just 2007. It was just, you know, almost seven years ago now. Um, what followed with that was I, there was this, uh, people, athletes started coming forward and saying, I'm dealing with this too. The first one was a guy named Ted Johnson, who was a famous linebacker for the Ring of Patriots, who went public with, he retired from post-concussion syndrome. He fell off the face of the earth. He got addicted to drugs. His marriage fell apart. And, and he's now doing much better, and he's a great radio host, but he, he struggled for a while. He boldly came forward and said, hey, I'm dealing with this. And other people shouldn't have to go through this out of ignorance. And luckily now that's happening everywhere, and I appreciate all the athletes that, that step forward and, and, and do say that now. The NFL still fought that messaging, though. Uh, if we can get the sound for this. 
Ira Kassin leads a team of NFL doctors who did a study of several hundred active players and reported that the concern over head injuries is overblown. Is there any evidence, as far as you're concerned, that links multiple head injuries among pro football players with depression? No. With dementia? No. With early onset of Alzheimer's? No. Is there any evidence as of today that, that links multiple head injuries with any long-term problem like that? In NFL players? Yeah. No. So that was, this was May 2007. This was the messaging that was getting out. And, and this is what was, you know, you look at a sport like American football, you know, I mean, this is, this, no one plays as adults because it's just dramatically too dangerous unless you pay them millions of dollars. So 99% of the people playing American football were children. And so that's the message that was getting out to people. Not only that, but when you got knocked out on the NFL fields, back then they were still putting you right back into the game and claiming it was scientifically valid. And so that, it was this sort of stuff that really flipped a switch in us that said, you know, this is just not right. This is just not fair to do this to the American public with profit being the motivation. Uh, so that's when, we, uh, that's when we actually started creating organizations to fight this battle. And we said, okay, you know, this, we've got to dig in here. And we've got to, we've got to change this culture because this is, you know, we can... You, there's no reason that people need to suffer all this brain damage and brain disease for sport. We can change how we play the sports. So we started uh, SLI as a charity in 2007. We part and then we, we sought out a research team to really move this CTE work forward, and build this brain bank, so we could actually show this is not an isolated problem. And so, and we, it, what we did is that we changed things a little bit, is we kind of moved away from finding people in traumatic brain injury work. They, you know, they, they, were do, they were doing great work, but we needed a different disease model. We weren't dealing with an injury um, and, and looking at the acute effects. We wanted to look at the long-term effects of a degenerative disease. So we actually took the Alzheimer's disease research team at BU and asked if they would commit themselves to CTE. And, and luckily they said uh, yes. And we became the first center in the world dedicated to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It was just completely ignored by the medical field. Uh, so now we focus on education, we focus on policy, and we try to advance this research. Uh, we got the NFL to change. It just took us two and a half years to go from there's no evidence to suggest a connection between the NFL and dementia to, well, it's quite obvious from the medical research that it's been done that concussions can lead to long-term problems. So um, it took a lot of work. It took congressional hearings. It took uh, media battering week in and week out. It took the announcers on the field starting to, get, uh, uh, you know, starting to get very uncomfortable with what they were seeing. It took a lot of people stepping forward. It took the widows of these players and the ones that were alive stepping forward and saying, we're going bankrupt caring for our dement demented husbands. But it, it was accomplished. And so now it, the focus, you know, it, it kind of released us from battling this public battle to saying, okay, well, how do we fix this problem? You know, what are the appropriate rational steps that we can take to do this? And, you know, one of them just focused on the fact that we have to acknowledge that concussion is not a temporary injury in the sense that we all kind of intuitively believe, and you just watch from your empirical experience, someone gets a concussion, they feel bad, it's really bad at the beginning, and then most of the time, the next day or a few hours later, they're fine. They can seem completely normal, they know where they are, they know what's happening. And, and so we assume that that was what was happening inside the brain. But luckily there was work uh, by a lot of people, including this is a slide from researchers at UCLA, showing that it's actually a cascade of events that happens with concussion that goes on for days and even weeks after the injury. And the real risk, and, and all this philosophy and, and messaging around getting athletes off the field and letting them recover is really built around this slide and this concept that your cells need time to get back to normal. And if you keep exposing them to trauma, you keep exposing them to even stress, physical and, and cognitive stress, you will prolong their recovery or tip them over the edge to long-term problems. So th this, is that, this is that research that says everybody needs to be out for a good period of time. Uh, and the advice really focuses on physical and cognitive rest now. And what we're trying to avoid with all these things, are, and I'm not, I, can't go in, I don't have time to go in depth in all of these, but I just want to acknowledge them. The bad things that are happening when you return to play too soon from concussion include you increase your risk of a second concussion and two on top of each other is dramatically worse than a single one. 
There's actually evidence, and it's worth mentioning, you, you are at a greatly increased risk for a lower body injury when you come back from concussion. And we're trying to get that message out to just get athletes to appreciate it's in their own interest. If they go back too soon, they're either out of shape or their, their uh, reaction time and balance is off, and so they get injured. Um, you do prolong your recovery. It's kind of the, the, the good analogy I got from one of my doctors back in the day was, it, you know, with, it's like an earthquake. A concussion's an earthquake in your brain. And all, you imagine all these buildings can get some structural damage, but they don't fall. And if you get inside the building and let them repair and, you know, spackle those walls back together, the, you know, another concussion comes and it still won't tear down the building. But if you don't have time during those weeks to get in and repair those cells, if that second concussion comes too soon, that's when things crumble. All right, and I found that analogy effective for, for my understanding. Then you're talking about post-concussion syndrome, which is this unfortunate minority of people that included me that just don't get better. They take years to get their brain back to normal. Some never recover. I still can't exercise hard without getting a headache. And then, uh, as, as was discussed by the minister, second impact syndrome, which has been on our radar screen a lot because it happens every year in football. And this year, I think we lost six or seven kids. Uh, but it just happened in Northern Ireland. Um, Sideline assessment's worth discussing as, as we have time because it, it's, it's one of those really important pieces, uh, places to focus. We know we missed most concussions. We've discussed about that. We know it's dangerous to play through them, and therefore we should be getting athletes off the field. And I know it's a hot topic here, and I, uh, you know, especially in rugby. You know, luckily, in, the, in our most dangerous sports, we have unlimited substitutions. So you can pop people in and out when they get hurt. But that's not the case in sports like rugby and soccer. And so I just want to say, from, from the way we, I look at things and the way we're kind of looking at things over there, right now what's being trialed at the, you know, in the youth level, the messaging is, is very good. When they're suspected, get off the field, stay off the field. When it comes down to uh, what's happening at the pro level, the discussions around the pitch side concussion assessment, and there's a five minute limitation on uh, right now being trialed as to that's how long you can be out uh, and still go back in if the doctor clears you with the concussion. And I just want to make the, the, the simple point that I, I, from my perspective, from my athlete perspective, from having been there on the, you know, in these sorts of competitions, I worry that we're looking at this the wrong way. Because when we, if it was, you know, I'm thinking if it was me out there and I'm out there putting my life on the line and my health on the line for the, for the team and for this game, um, if I did get a brain injury, or a suspected brain injury, and I have to go to the sideline to be assessed whether or not it's safe for me to return. And with things like second impact syndrome out there, this is a life or death decision. If I, if I get cleared incorrectly and I get another hit, I'm gonna die. Um, I would hope that they wouldn't pressure my doctor to make a fast decision, all right? Because we know that doctors have a very hard time diagnosing this. They don't have great objective tools. They can just instantly figure this out. And so, from, from, a, from a moral perspective, the idea that we are setting a time limit on how long a doctor can assess his patient is, I do not believe, personally correct. All right? it, it, there, if, 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 God forbid, somebody does get incorrectly diagnosed because they put a time limit on it, I mean, there will be, a, there will be problems. So I hope that uh, that is that is we don't look at this just from you know and the argument on the other side is really I think f largely focused on tradition. It is hard to break traditions. All right, it, it, traditionally you know you li you limit your substitutions. You you have to be tough to play this game. You have to stay on the field with, and play through injury. And I get that, but tradition is a terrible reason to sentence somebody to uh, a lifetime of avoidable brain damage because they were put back when they shouldn't have been. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, this, and, and I'll just show a video, video to remind everybody that you know, this, this is still happening. Um, yeah, you know, Georgie's an extremely tough player. This is just a few months here. back. Whether he stays in the field or if he goes off, he is going to be a very sore man. Tomorrow. Concussion rule, he's got some time to get over the collision. That's all good, there is a big gun between second and third. Well, just four and a half, but it's gone. Yeah. Wonderful replacement. That, that athlete was cleared to go back in because he passed the sideline test. So, uh, of course, that's a bigger problem. That's a lot to do with the training, but that's just, that sort of stuff is just unacceptable uh, in this day and age.
Uh, so I want to touch on um, what, what we know now about chronic traumatic encephalopathy as well, because this, this is a little bit of an area of, I guess, controversy, although it really shouldn't be. Um, you know, there, there's, so, so I'm going to show you the work primarily of, of Dr. Ann McKee, who's our, our neuropathologist at Boston University. And, and, you know, we were lucky to get her. I mean, she, she was an expert in Alzheimer's disease. She ran the National uh, Veterans uh, ALS Brain Bank, and, uh, and among others. Uh, her control group was the Framingham Heart Study, which is a town outside of Boston that's been studied for three generations. And so these are people with medical records going back their whole lives that serve as our controls. Um, what we, you know, what the disease is uh, from a visual perspective is on the left, you have a, a healthy brain, 65-year-old from the Framingham Heart Study, no history of brain injury. Uh, and basically, you just look at this, you just know that the brown is bad. The brown is uh, a, a abnormal protein called tau. Tau, is, tau is, has a normal, uh, a normal part of the structure of the cell. And then with trauma, with a lot of diseases, it can become damaged. It's called hyperphosphorylated. And you actually we have a technician staining these, these brains by hand with an antibody that makes it light up brown. So left is control. We know a lot about tau because we know about it from Alzheimer's disease. So the brain on the right is an uh, Alzheimer's disease brain with dementia. So that's all the cells you have to lose to not be able to take care of yourself. And in the middle are, there are actually two different athletes, two 40-something NFL players. So that's what chronic traumatic encephalopathy looks like. And, and the advantage of studying this disease has been that it is very visual. It's very striking. Concussion, again, is invisible. This is something you can see. And, these are, and when uh, you see these brain images, you start to understand what's going on. So this is tau. So this is the tau, the, and I didn't know this until I actually got into this research. You have little tunnels in your axon called microtubules, and they're held together by this tau. It's a structural part. And for some reason, it falls apart, and these brown splotches are these, are these clumps. It likes to clump together. Um, so, and I show you this not, you know, this isn't a science lesson, but I just want to show that smart people have figured this out. There's not a, you know, the, the, people like to uh, pretend there's a lot more mystery to this disease than there really is. Uh, you know, and there's a debate, and it was, it was a big deal in the Zurich meeting, and I think they made the wrong decision in the statements that they, that they made. Uh, what is the link between CTE and trauma, uh, or CTE and, uh, yeah, brain trauma? Because there are still people out there saying there's no proven link. And I just want to have an honest discussion that uh, proof from a scientific perspective, there, there's various levels of proof. And the type of proof that they're saying when they're saying there's no proof is they're saying there's no proof because there's no prospective, double-blinded, uh, long-term study starting now and going for forward for 100 years showing that people who take brain trauma uh, get this and people who don't do not, and that there's a causative link. And the problem is that if you set the bar that high, guess what? We're never going to get there, all right? Because your medical schools are not going to allow us to create, take two populations of babies, all right, and hit this group in the head a lot of times and not hit this group and then watch them grow up and see what happens, all right? That's against medical ethics, all right? So we do it with animals, and we can give them CTE, but we can't do it with uh, people. And so we have to go with a, a rational level of evidence. And if you, if you go to a, you know, if you extrapolate down to different levels of evidence, right now what we know, there's a lot of things we know, and one of them is nobody in the world has ever been diagnosed with CTE who did not take extraordinary brain trauma in their lives. Athletes, military veterans, victims of abuse, epileptics who fell too many times. There's a circus clown shot out of a cannon too much who it was a dwarf engaged in dwarf tossing. And there's even people, there's three people who had developmental disabilities and who just banged their head against a wall all day. They developed this, all right? So when we say there's no proof, the, the question that comes back is says, okay, well, name me one thing that ties this group of people together. If people throw out alcohol and drugs, I can promise you the developmentally disabled are not doing that. Uh, people throw out genetics. Um, I mean, they, there's been no evidence that there's a single gene that connects these people. And I don't even know if there's any good investigations or anyone looking into that. We can't find one exposure, one common factor other than the trauma. So if you want to hold out and wait for this miracle connection to show up, go ahead. 
That's, that's your choice in your life. But from a policy perspective, from a healthcare policy perspective and a sports youth policy perspective, until that other thing shows up, let's just assume it's trauma and let's start moving forward on that assumption. Uh, and so, and, and we learned this through scouring the world's literature on this. Again, the, you know, the, the reason we know about all these other groups of people is because we actually looked uh, through every publication ever on CTE, and surprisingly, only through 2007, there were only 45 cases in the literature. Again, why we did not know a whole lot about this. No one was looking at it. We, we just published a case series of 68 new cases, and that's only half of what we have. Some of these people are well-known. Dave Dewerson was one uh, who, who shot himself in the heart, left this uh, note asking us to study his brain because of his immense downfall from 45 to 50, and I don't have time to go to the full thing, but of course, uh, he had the disease. You know, oh, my gosh. It, it, it's all about that lifetime of brain trauma. We don't know where people get it. If they start at 8, if they started at, at 80, this, is, this was Dave's brain. He was stage 3 out of 4. He was right that he had the disease. Uh, it's a similar pattern that we see over and over again. I don't want you have the time to go into the full details, uh, but <clears throat> essentially what we see is you see, uh, you know, some damage in the, in the frontal lobe. The tops here are all frontal lobe, and that's where we believe it starts when I show you the younger cases, and then it progresses. It has the ability to progress as people age and get down to the medial temporal lobe, which is, involves areas like the hippocampus, which you need functioning for creating new memories, the amygdala for emotional control, and it ravages those areas. And so that's why you know, you're starting to see in the media this, they're fine, they're fine, then in their midlife they fall apart. It probably has a lot to do with the fact that that's about when the disease is starting to destroy their medial temporal lobe. Uh, eight, you know, the, our first active uh, college football player in the U.S. was the co-captain of the University of Pennsylvania football team who took his life weeks after being voted captain. He already had 20 spots in his brain uh, starting to rot away. Uh, you know, our, our previous youngest was Eric Pelly at 18 years old who had a couple of focal spots. Uh, our now youngest is 17. Uh, in terms of what we now know, this is published last December. Um, you know, our brain big is now up to 182. I haven't updated the slide. We published our first 85 sequentially. Just said, here's our experience of the first 85 brains. You know, of course, we, we, we know our, our samples bias, so this is not a way to get to a, way, a number of prevalence. We don't know what percent of people have this. But, but yeah, and we seek out cases where we hear of symptoms, families come to us when they see symptoms. But it's still shocking, even with that assumption, that out of the first 85, 68 were positive, including 34, 35 pro American football players, nine of nine college football players, six of 13 who only played through high school and stopped before 18. Uh, I mean, e even if we, I mean, we almost have to be clairvoyant to be able to successfully pick out the people, even if they did have symptoms. Uh, this is the staging system that Dr. Ann McKee developed that provides additional evidence that this is a progressive disease. All of the young cases, if you're in your teens or your early 20s, are stage one. And then it seems to spread to neighboring tissue in stage two in the frontal lobe. Uh, move on to the medial temporal in stage three, and in stage four, it, it captures most of the brain. And that's when clinically, 90% of those people in stage four in the bottom right are suffering from full-blown dementia. They can't take care of themselves. And the average time between stages is 11 years, according to our data. Uh, but And clinically, when your brain is, is, is falling apart like that, you start to see problems with cognitive problems, behavioral problems, emotional problems. Those are the big three. Uh, in terms of what we should do going forward, you know, I'm lucky now to serve as an advisor to places, you know, again, you know, we were on the outside five years ago, now we're on the inside. People have said, this is, this is in, in the U.S., this is real, let's deal with it. So the NFL Players Association, we advise Major League Lacrosse, we wrote their concussion policies last year from the ground up on, on the corporate side. They said, we don't, we don't want to endanger any of our athletes, it's, it's too expensive, um, and, and, you know, we want to do what's right for the game. And so uh, we wrote very strict protocols for them because uh, they had only had one concussion <laughs> the year before we got there, so they knew the players weren't reporting. We put in a very strong educational program. We got them up to seven. Uh, we'll get them higher. WWE now has, uh, requires our, tra our training for every one of their athletes. The Ivy League, uh, we serve as consultants too. So the general goals of all these changes that we make are pretty simple and they're pretty benign on paper. Right? It's let's reduce the risk of getting concussions. Let's reduce the total brain trauma exposure. Because I'd love to go into this for a very long time, uh, but I'll just say there's growing evidence that it's not just the concussions that are the problem. And this is where a lot of our policy is getting focused on. You don't need symptoms to suffer brain damage. 
All right, a new study just came out uh, out of uh, Dartmouth University two days ago looking at uh, using sophisticated scans, diffusion tensor imaging on football players. Athletes without concussions are still getting physical brain damage, according to their studies. Uh, and it's been seen in soccer, it's been seen, you know, German researchers, it, it, it's everywhere. Uh, increase your chances of recognizing concussion signs and symptoms when they happen, so increase that uh, recognition rate, that reporting rate. Um, and then limit chance of players returning to play early, and then create informed consent, which is always a personal thing for me. You know, make sure that if they are going to make bad decisions, that they know what they're getting into. Uh, methods of improving those, uh, these outcomes for athletes include education and culture change, uh, rules and policy change during games. Right? You know, we make up the rules every year as we go. There's never a better reason to change the rules than for health. Uh, and also... Uh, changes in practice and in amateur sports. So in a, a, a constant message that we're, we're talking about at the NFL PA is if we want to make the NFL players have better outcomes in the future, it's really not going to be about what happens at the NFL level because by that time they've had most of their brain trauma exposure and it's been as kids. So they're taking a leadership role in saying let's make the youth sport safer so they get to us with much, much less brain damage. And then point four is, is medical policy. Again, you know, continue to improve medical policy, uh, give doctors more tools to use, give them more time, uh, more training. Um, is, uh, I'll say what, one key point that I actually think is, is a good discussion point in rugby going forward um, is what you do in the off season. Because I know that you know, it, it, when you change the game itself, especially when you're a pro sport and it's on television, you do risk the business model. And so there's, it, it, it's, and it is a business at that point. You know, people, you know, the players are making money, the teams are making money, the fans are loving it. You know, people, there's more concern about changing that. But what's really easy to change is what happens between those games. All right. Uh, you know, in the, the, and the NFL uh, Player Association latched on to that when we showed them the data that said half, or, sorry, more than half the hits to the head are coming in practice. So the, the one single step that you can make to make athletes safer and cut their risk of concussion and pro hopefully cut their risk of CTE significantly is by cutting out hitting in practice. You can cut out hits to the head by half. There's nothing else you can do that will cut out risk by half. Okay, so they said, you're right. They bargained with the NFL. They got down to one day of hitting a week rather than four during the season. And uh, they've never been healthier, they've never been happier. They also get fewer regular injuries. And so it's been incredibly positive. And I know, and, and that's, I know that the rugby world is starting to have that discussion, that it would be a simple fix to just change the training methods so that uh, people don't get hit in the head as much uh, during the week. Um, one of the other things that we focus on uh, with youth is trying to get, to get them to really think about uh, all the opportunities they have. And so we created a, a new microsite, concussionchecklist.org, where um, we send all of our parents and coaches to. When they say, well, what, what should I be doing? Is it helmets? Is it education? Is it policy? You know, I, I'm so confused by it. There's so many opportunities. And so uh, we created this website to say there's 10 areas that you should look at. Education, prevention, remove from play, return to play, return to school, the messaging you give about sending the kids home, return to life, your medical infrastructure. You know, do you have a medical professional at contact practices for children? No. We give them to the pros. We don't give them the kids. Equipment, rules and penalties, and then playing area and surfaces. You know, one of the fascinating things I learned in October when I was working with the Rugby Players Association in London was that they, it, rugby cancels games with frozen fields because of the risk of injury. And I was like, wow, that's brilliant. I said, we've never, ever had a discussion in the U.S. about canceling a sports game because of a frozen field. Uh, you know, and, and then, of course, last week, somebody actually got a really bad concussion hitting their head on frozen turf in the NFL. Uh, so so we, don't, we don't always think about those things. Uh, so all of those areas need to be reviewed, and we actually have a 30-question test that we give to parents that then, when, if there's things they could be doing that they're not, will e email them a follow-up with all the links to the things they could be doing. A lot of it has to do with education. Again, it's the number one change... That we, that we can make in terms of uh, long-term change in the culture. There's no way that we should put an athlete out there who has never been trained on concussion. There's no way we should let coaches coach children who have never been trained on concussion. It's now law in 49 out of our 50 states. 
Uh, there's always one state we can't get to. Uh, but four out of 50, that, that every coach has to be educated every year. And it's important to recognize we may not successfully be able to train them either because 10-year-olds, uh, two-thirds need, think they need to be knocked out. All right? Half can name zero or one concussions. So, and no one's proven we can change that knowledge. We don't have any studies that say we can take, teach a 10-year-old, hey, you know what, I just got a concussion. It's going to be bad for me when I'm 50, so I'm going to get, take myself out and tell my coach. All right? We don't know if we can do that. And so that, it's that kind of logic that's saying, well, maybe we shouldn't hit him in the head so much because I'm not sure we can convince 10-year-olds what's going on. Why expose them to that risk if they don't know what's going to happen and they don't have a medical professional there to help them identify it? We need to change the messaging. This is a, a lost message that um, was, was said by the Harvard football team doctor from before my time. I found it in a book. Uh, he used to say to the team, and the coach proudly said, you know, Doc gave a speech again, in case any man, any game gets hurt by a hit to the head so he does not realize what he's doing, his teammate should at once insist that time be called and a doctor come onto the field to see the trouble. All right? So let's think about that. They were told, call time out if you think your teammate has a concussion, and pull me on the field. Was anyone ever given this speech when they were an athlete? Was anyone ever asked to point out their teammates with concussions? No, it never happened in the US either. Is anyone giving this speech right now who might be in a coaching position for their kids or pros? You give the speech? Atta boy, last night, good. <laughs> Just under the wire. This speech was given in 1905, all right? It's a piece of lost wisdom that we still do not do. It's not part of our, even our education in the US right now. All right, so you think about the gaps that we have. And, and I look at this and I say, we're letting those kids down. It's a five second conversation to tell them, hey, your, your buddy doesn't know what's happening. They're asking you what the play is over and over again. Speak up. We don't ask them to do that. And, and, and so we're never going to diagnose the concussions. Um, and I'll say, you know, uh, you know so, so what to do is a long list of things, a long list of things, but what we ask is the athletes to be their own advocate, because even if the system fails, when the system fails and somebody gets brain damage they shouldn't have had, and this is something that I didn't appreciate and it was too late, the, only one, the, you know, the system will move on, the sport will move on, your coaches will move on, the person who's left suffering is, is you, and eventually it's you and your family. So you have to be your own advocate. You have to step up for yourself and say, I'm not going to let this happen. And, you know, and I still believe that what's good for the players is good for the game. And so I hope we take this and think about other ways that we can secure a stronger and better future for sports by protecting the athletes. And, and I always end by recognizing you know, we know this information. We've learned a lot of these lessons because there are a lot of people who are no longer with us. And these are all people that have been studied because they died young and, and their family gave their brain to our brain bank. And it's now, again, 182 people that have taught us that the old way of doing things was the wrong way of doing things. So I hope you think about them as we plan uh, a safer future for everybody that we care about. But thank you again for having me here. And they blocked a little time for questions. So, um, does anyone have any? Yes, sir. So we got microphones too. Um, I know you didn't mention it, but it's baseline testing. What do you think of it? And uh, I know some professional athletes were coming out saying that they can rig it, so it wouldn't be as effective. But I was thinking of trying to bring it into where I work. What mm -hmm. do you think of it? You know, um, I, uh, we are very much supporters of baseline testing. Um, you're right that athletes can cheat it, which is why education is so important. So they recognize. I actually gave a speech at a college recently to the athletes, uh, where the athletic trainer said four players walked up to him after the talk and said, "Can I retake my baseline?" Because they had cheated it. So educate them first, and then baseline them, so they recognize it's in their own interest to help you keep them safe. But I do, I do encourage it, and you'll hear more about it in, what, in the next speeches. Sure. Yes, uh, you can choose. You got the mic. All right, go ahead. Uh, just in relation to the NFL specifically, um, in reducing the tackling in practice, um, a lot of concussions happen on interceptions. 
so you don't have offensive linemen making tackles in practice, so they don't know what they're doing when an interception happens in a game. Is the next step to force the the actual type of practice that's being that's being engaged in, so that offensive linemen know what a proper form tackle is, whereas they wouldn't be getting that on a day to day basis. Uh, yeah, it's a great question, and, and the answer is I, I, you're looking at it a little differently, uh, or a little backwards. It's only because you didn't play maybe. Uh, the reason they're offensive linemen is because they are bad tacklers. You put your best athletes on defense, <laughs> and then you put your big guy, and you, then you take your other guys and you, you fatten them up and make them offensive linemen. So uh, they're not going to make good tackles whether or not you teach them. Uh, but you know, you're right. I mean, uh, it is a, it's an in football is an extremely dangerous game in the sense that there's a lot of times where there's just bodies flying everywhere and you can't see what's going on. And, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a hard problem to make those big guys into athletes. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yes. So, sorry for my English. Uh, I appreciate what you have uh, presented to us. Uh, I have already traveled a long time in your country, and uh, I was very surprised all the people who are um, very especially kindly with handicapped people. And I think it's your uh, history and your mentality to do that. What I appreciate is that you show us that there is a, um, a way to prevent and to help people to take care about them because they are responsible of their health. But um, what is also interesting in back of this is that um, the sport is also a money problem. Uh, it's a lot of money to have a, a, a trainer and to become a, a good uh, player. And so I think that um, after your, your presentation, in my, my head it was, uh, in your country I know that who makes something handicapped must pay. And so it's very important that those people who, who take a lot of money from the sport to, to, to train people and to put them uh, in danger, because it's a danger, they have to pay for that. And they have to pay for the prevention and to prepare to... to, ev to um, Evite. to avoid that the people become so handicapped. Yeah, that's a, it's a great comment. Thank you. You know, it is interesting. You know, the NFL now does pay for all the oral form players, no matter what the cause is, for dementia care, so it doesn't bankrupt their family. They're actually put in $30 million, and now they're putting another 100 into research. And, so, and, and they're actually just started a training program for kids, so they are starting to take that responsibility on. Uh, which has been nice to see because it's it's really I think advanced things and made people's lives better. It must be so in, in, in Europe. It would be so in Europe. It should, it should be so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm Nicola Ryle. I'm actually a consultant in rehabilitation medicine at our National Rehabilitation Hospital. Um, I'm curious about what you were talking about uh, after the first concussion. You spoke about if they go back too soon. What do you mean by going back too soon? What time frames do you have? What evidence do you have about, the t about those time frames? That's great. You know, there is a wonderful concussion management talk that's going to happen soon. So I'm going to leave that to the, uh, the experts. Uh, but I mean, this, this, the one sentence answer is you want to make sure that their brain has recovered to, to where it was in every test you can do, uh, which is your indication that those cells have returned to as close to normal as they will and reduces your risk of further injury. But I'll, I'll let the doctor share all that uh, with one of the next. You're next, right? Next. After the coffee break, you're going to get all those answers. We have one here. Mark Hampton from. Oh, from not working. Uh, we got another Mark one. Mark Hampton from Belfast. Yep. I've been watching, I've played uh, rugby at a reasonable level uh, in this country and I've watched the NFL for years and I've often wondered why you've been allowed to lead with the head for so long. What are the chances of the NFL waking up and saying no head tackles, no leading with the head? Uh, it was an accident waiting to happen. Great question. No, I, I, I completely agree that it, it, it is bizarre that we were allowed to, and taught to use it as a weapon. When I was growing up, I was told, hit hit with this, that's where you're going to deliver the most force. Um, they, well, it's one of those things that it's actually technically illegal to lead with your head. It's been in the rule books forever. They're starting to enforce it in a lot of different situations, so there's been dramatic change in the last two years. Players are now getting ejected 
for it, you know, intentionally leading with the head and striking another player in the head. And that, so that, so, but the reality is with the game being so fast and so many people that they're still head contact at every play. So they're only penalizing the most egregious things. And so you know, I think that is one of the, one of the you know, r really bright things about rugby is that it, you know, it is illegal. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of accidental brain trauma, but you're not intentionally killing each other like we were. I hope that all of your research actually makes them wake up because I've watched the NFL for years and I've seen plenty of yellow flags being thrown and I'm yet to see one for a guy leading with a head. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're right. It's a big problem. You know, so we go to coffee. One more in the back. Uh, is it working? No. Yep. Okay, you can hear me, Grant. Uh, Emmett Ryan, Sunday Business Post. Uh, I suppose one of the differences between like the US and Europe is like there's actually you know a state cost as well it, with 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 acquired brain injury. Like, is that one of the things you're sort of trying to get across when talking to like government officials over here? Is that well, it's going to cost your health service a whole lot of cash if you don't address this. You know, it's it's. Um, it's not an argument that we can use at all in the U.S. because of private insurance and the messed up healthcare system that we that we employ. So, um, you know, it is. We we have used it a bit because the government does fund some healthcare and especially older people. But you're right. I think it's just that's just a really good point, and I didn't raise it, and maybe I should. That it, it, it right. It is a it is a cost borne by all of us if we are increasing our risk of dementia. And this is a, you know, this is one of the only preventable dementias. As far as we know, you don't get hit in the head, you are not going to get this disease. And so the idea that we're creating it and then we're going to have to pay for it uh, is a model that we should dig into a little more and, and does play, then does give the state uh, more impetus to get involved. So that's a good point. I hope you're right about it. <laughs> all right. Oh, all right, we'll do one more. I'll let you get your coffee. The guy's too big to say no to. Um, I just wondered if you look at the development of, of sports that don't use helmets like rugby, uh, soccer, rugby particularly, and you look at the development of the NFL sport over the last 120 years, do you think the presence of helmets has led to a behaviour in play and a behaviour in culture that leads to the, the very actions that are going to ironically lead to head injury? You don't see it as much in rugby per se, right. you see the I, accidental. I would say absolutely. That, that, that putting the helmets on, you know, we put the helmets on because people were dying from skull fractures. And if you, so you don't have a skull fracture problem, you don't really need helmets because it doesn't protect the brain like we, we all assumed it did when I was 13 and someone had me a helmet. I said, okay, my, my head's going to be fine now. So, uh, but it wasn't necessarily just the helmet that really changed football and, and ice hockey. It was actually the addition of the face mask. You know, if you just put a helmet on, people still don't necessarily want to lead with their head because they're going to mess up their face. <laughs> when you cover up the face, that then creates the weapon. So the, it's a combination of the two. And I, sorry, we had one more, and then I get to, then I'm told Thank to stop. Uh, Dan Healy, Beaumont Hospital, where you may recall speaking uh, two years yes. ago. Um, my question is this. With all these rules, regulations, potentially laws, where does that leave boxing? Ah, good question. We, we don't talk about boxing a whole lot just because it's just kind of known. Like the American Medical Association came out in the 1980s just saying boxing should be banned. It's a terrible idea. It's going to leave everyone with brain injuries. Stop. And, and that messaging really, you know, for the most part, got it out of children taking part in it. So now it still happens, but it's, it really is a socioeconomic thing now. And, and, you know, then you get into those arguments of, well, it's better for them because it provides some structure. And, but no, but I, I wouldn't advise anyone to box, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just a really bad idea for, if you care at all about your brain. Um, but because, because I don't have the power to change that, you know, what we do advise folks is, especially the pros, we say, well, and, you know, one of, one of our uh, biggest supporters is a guy named Mickey Ward, he's a legend in the U.S. I, you know, Irish Mickey Ward, you guys probably know him. Irish Mickey Ward, he's a big supporter of our work, he's uh, going to give us his brain when he passes away, but he trained every day with headshots. And he wishes if he knew now what he knew back then, he would have only allowed the headshots in, in, in the ring when there's money on the line. And in his training, he would have said, you hit my head, I'm going <laughs> to knock you out. So, uh, and so you know, there's still dramatic improvement that could be made in boxing. Uh, so you walk away with much lower risk. But, of course, if you're trying to knock each other out, I mean, 
we kind of know what we're getting into. But then again, I will say that we just told a family of a boxer in Chicago that, uh, the, the, who gave us the brain that he had stage three CT and he had a really rough last 10 years of his life. Um, and the family was surprised. They actually didn't know about punch drunk. You know, the father boxed for a long time, but the 20 something children, the 20, 20 year old children, no one had ever sat them down and talked about it. So uh, it's not as well known as we think. And I got the highest sign, so we're done. Thank you again very much for having me.